Two days' time, voters go to the polls in the Rochester by-election, prompted by the defection of its incumbent MP, Mark Reckless, from the Conservatives to UKIP. No surprise, both parties have been throwing the kitchen sink at it. Here's our Giles. Rochester in Kent, perched on the banks of the Medway, has a proud history. Its castle was besieged by King John, a cathedral, a place of worship in use for well over a thousand years. Its high street almost unchanged since the days Dickens lived in the area and, as you do, a rotting Russian Soviet submarine moored in the river. Ironically, 300 years ago, Rochester's MP died, along with 2,000 other sailors, after going down with all hands and three other ships in one of Britain's greatest naval disasters. Rochester's last MP may reflect that leaving Westminster in a break with history and tradition always risks being founded and sunk. Many others thought Mark Reckless was living his name when he announced this year at UKIP's conference he was resigning as a Conservative and an MP and would fight a by-election as a UKIP candidate. His former colleagues felt betrayed and were determined to torpedo his chances. But it is them he has turned his electoral fire on. The Prime Minister rather sort of took it for granted here and then assumed that if he and lots of MPs came down to can campaign, that would help. But actually, I think it's telling many Labour voters perhaps to support me if they want to defeat the Tories. And having a Tory MP coming and describing Strood as Benefit Street, um, hard-working people in Strood, I, I think that's counterproductive. By elections are just part and parcel of our electoral system and some come and go without causing much of a ripple. But others have the potential for causing real shockwaves. And that's certainly what UKIP are hoping to do in Rochester and Strood. But it's not over yet. Not everyone is buying it. The Conservatives would dearly like to beat their once one of our own by a combination of big name campaign appearances and simultaneously keeping the focus local. With me, You've got a true local candidate who purely is in it for the people of Rochester and Strood and to get what's right for this area. And that's why I've spent time coming up with my six-point plan and, and I've been very clear about that and I think it's strong and I do think that I am the only candidate in this by-election who has got a strong plan who can deliver on that. Once, in a slightly different guise, this constituency was Labour, the vast majority of it not being chocolate box pretty and facing the same pressures as much of the UK, not least small businesses. Labour still have voters here and they aren't chucking in the towel. I'm not a huge fan of tactical voting. I'd always say to people, vote with your heart, vote for the party that you believe and who you feel would really deliver for you. And I believe that that's the Labour Party because we're the only ones who are talking about the NHS, who are talking about education, who are talking about housing and the future of this country um, in a way that gives, can give people hope. In a local sweet shop, the customer polling is considered by the owner to be more accurate than any national pollsters. And if so, the Greens are giving the others something to chew on. They also have other aims alongside trying to win. The most important thing is to continue what we're calling the Green Surge. So we're seeing a swell in membership of something like 80% in this past year alone. And a representation of that uh, magnitude in, t in terms of our sort of polling position would be exactly what we would expect. And if we can ensure that Natalie Bennett is included on the leadership debate, then that would be another huge victory for us to make sure that that happens. Being a Lib Dem in a by-election right now can feel like a medieval castle, a little besieged. But here, their long-standing team have seen the party fortune survive the battering rams of electoral fortune, and they remain upbeat. I was expecting people to be really angry, but I've had one or two, but mostly uh, there are actually students who think they've been affected by the changes to the university fees, but when I explain to them, actually they're better off than what they would have been under Labour with the income they're earning, they start to rethink what they've been told. Parliamentary convention suggests this could be the last by-election before the general in May next year. The one thing Rochester might tell us is that for all the parties, even newer ones, nothing can be guaranteed anymore, and electoral history as future predictor is well past its sell-by date. And Giles still not there again. And the BBC's assistant political editor, Norman Smith, is in Rochester. The mood, Norman, what's it like? Well, I think there's no doubt this is all set to be a UKIP win. They seem to have an awful lot of momentum behind them, which in a way 
is surprising given the amount of effort that Team Cameron have put in in trying to just halt the UKIP bandwagon. They've had hundreds of volunteers here down at the weekends. Tory MPs have been told, get down to Rochester again and again and again. David Cameron has been here, I think, uh, five times, and yet, actually, it doesn't seem to have made a blind bit of difference to the UKIP bandwagon. And in some ways, actually, I think it's rebounded against the Conservatives because you sense there's almost a feeling that this has become some sort of David and Goliath contest, and people are thinking, well, we're not going to go with a big bullying Tory party machine, we're going to go with plucky little UKIP. And I think actually the Tories have kind of clocked to that and are now pulling back from just pouring in resources. The other thing which strikes me about it, just talking to Tory MPs, is the sense of fatalism about the result. They've pretty much factored in they are going to lose here. And then you say, well, what is going to happen? Uh, that's going to cause huge ructions in your party. And they say, well, no, not really. And it's quite bizarre because wind back about three or four weeks and there were all sorts of rumours about people demanding David Cameron's head if he lost this uh, by-election, threats of major ructions. Now I don't get any sense of that at all. And I think the sort of view amongst many Tory MPs is maybe this is just a by-election blip. Maybe this is just a passing phase. Mm. I have to say, I'm not at all sure it is. I wonder if something more fundamental is going on. All right, well, we'll discuss that further. Norman Smith in Rochester, thank you. I mean, Peter Cullen, before we come to that point, where is UKIP support coming from in this by-election? Uh, in this by-election, it's coming from all over the place. It, it, it's reminiscent of some of those really uh, uh, startling liberal, liberal and Lib Dem by-election mm. triumphs in, in years gone by. UKIP at first, when it was climbing from 5 to 10 percent last year, that was overwhelmingly from Conservatives. Above 10 percent it comes from all over the place of people who are worried about immigration and the way Britain's going. But once you get into these sort of by-election figures, 58 percent in Clacton, perhaps 45 or 50 percent in Rochester, you are simply getting it from everywhere and it is a, it is a, it is a cry of rage. You know, the, I think the, the UKIP model is, is that Peter Finch character, Howard Beale in, in the network, uh, you know, I'm as mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. And I think that's what this is about. Right, so actually, as you say, they're coming from all the parties and presumably all types of voters in terms of profile. All types of voters. And just as when the Lib Dems got these massive votes, it wasn't really a vote for Europe or proportional representation. It was an attack on the main parties. This is, you know, anti... Uh, not just anti the big parties, because what we find in UGOV I mean, across, uh, you know, ac across the country is people are less trusting of business, of the police, of doctors, of teachers, of civil servants, of the local government, thing. the whole establishment. Nigel Farage talks about we're taking on the establishment. A very well chosen word because it's a much wider sense of discontent than even just the politi politicians of Westminster. Although the parties try very hard to paint him as part mm. of the establishment now, but it obviously isn't working mm. in terms of voter response. Then is it a blip? Is it like those by-elections, as you've described, that the Liberal Democrats used to do so well in? Um, or do you know or have a sense about whether people will support UKIP now um, in places like Rochester and Stroud and then go back to their original party of choice, if they weren't UKIP before, in the general election? Yeah, plenty, many well. There was a poll a week ago by Lord Ashcroft, commissioned by Lord Ashcroft, in which he found a UKIP, I think, 12 or 13 points ahead, maybe 15 points ahead. But when you ask the same people, how will you vote in the general election, then it's back to a narrow Conservative victory. So the UKIP vote will end up next May much higher than it would have been without this by election. But whether Mark Reckless will now hold the seat from this by election just for another five, five and a half months, or whether he'll hold on to it for longer, can I just one little bit of walk down history lane? Mm. A similar thing on the left happened in the early 70s. Dick Tavern, who was a rising star of the Labour Party, but, but, but thought the Labour Party was drifting too far to the left. MP for Lincoln. He resigned from the um, Labour Party and fought a, resigned as MP and fought a by-election. And he won that by-election in Lincoln in early 73 with a majority of 13,000. Mm. Huge majority, nearly 60% of the vote. By the end of 74, he was out. Margaret Beckett had reclaimed the seat uh, for Labour. Uh, so, you know, the, it, yes, it is a by-election blip, but whether it's only a by-election blip, different question. Right, well, we'll leave it there. We'll find out, of course, won't we, on Thursday and then at the general election.